Welcome to your ADHD life. This is Dr. Kirsten Milliken. Today's guest is Jeff Copper from Attention Talk Radio. We're gonna talk about the high levels of success that can happen when the right accommodations and supports are in place and the frustration of not being able to achieve that same kind of success when those supports and accommodations just aren't there. Enjoy the show. Uh, on this particular one, since this is a little bit more in your ADD life, you want to lead like you're interviewing me? Why don't we just have Maybe. a conversation like we That'll usually work. do? Okay. <laughs> How's that? How about we That'll... both, we could, you know, <sighs> we can say we're trying this new strategy. That'll there work. you go. We are co-hosting and co-guesting. <laughs> Right. Co-host, co-guest. Yep. Co-hosting and co-guesting. So yeah. So they get both of us. So with that yep. said, you want to introduce yourself, Jeff? Have we started? <laughs> sure. I've always just, I've always already started. So. Okay. Yeah. All right, so I'm Jeff Copper, DIG coach, and I'm an ADHD and attention coach, and I'm here with uh, Dr. Kirsten Milliken, who's a psychologist and an ADHD coach herself, and we're here for a great, lively conversation in a real new format. Kirsten, you ready for this? I am totally ready, Jeff. This is a whole new thing. You know I love new things. Oh, I love new things. So this, so this would be a lot of fun. So this is actually conceived because Kirsten has been the host uh, or co-host of Attention Talk Radio several different times. And she started her own podcast, Your ADHD Life. And she had me on it a while ago. And she did such a spectacular job interviewing. And I said, hey, we can do some joint content and share this on both platforms. So everybody, this is a joint marketing effort, if you will, to share really, really good content and, uh, and have a really good time doing it. And uh, I think today one of the topics I wanted to talk about was really my ADHD life and some of the fortunate uh, parts of my life and some uh, compensatory strategies that I've had and some of the challenges that I've had as a result of some of that stuff. You game, Kirsten? I'm totally game. I had a great time last time and I want and I know the audience wanted to hear more. So, yeah, so you know, I have uh, dyslexia. I have a learning disability, among other things. And one of my challenges coming through is school was very difficult for me, but I really enjoyed athletics. And when I went through school, uh, I think I graduated high school with a 2.8. Uh, you graduated high school. Yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, with an SAT score of 880. Now, I'll mind you, is they give you 800 points for putting your name on the test. So I only got 80 points out of it. And when I was going through high school, I was not able to handle English, much less Spanish. Yeah. So I didn't take that and I couldn't handle chemistry. So I really didn't go through a college prep curriculum. And uh, I, I had tutors and my mother helped me a lot through that, that process. But um, I was fortunate enough to go to college on a swimming scholarship. So they, eh, you know, they fudged things a little bit, maybe I don't necessarily know, but I kind of got in. But that was kind of a, but my first kind of luck of the draw that kind of got me through high school and into college. And then when I got to college, the cool thing about being an athlete uh, back in the 80s is so that you uh, can work around your practice schedule, you get to go into uh, registration first. And back in those days, it was all a manual process. And not only that, but uh, we had athletic uh, academic counselors who knew classes and knew teachers. And I could talk about my learning style and stuff. And so not only did I get to go in and pick the choice of the class, but I also got to teach the teachers and stuff. So I was always afforded that opportunity to pick some of the better teachers uh, and some of the classes. Uh, they weren't easy classes, but they were with teachers who could teach it really, really well. So that was an advantage that I had. In addition to that, as an athlete, I had unlimited tutors for free. Ugh. And I, I'll never forget Unli when I was- that's a, like, that, that needs like a whole ad right there. Unlimited tutors for free. <laughs> Absolutely. So at Indiana University, my first semester, my sophomore year, I had the highest tutoring bill on campus. Now, mind you, the athletic department paid for it, but I remember my calculus teacher was so confusing that I actually would just go to the tutor, have them teach it to me, but I had to go to class in case there was a pop quiz. And I remember one day I made the mistake of listening to her and she confused me <laughs> and did poorly. But needless to say is, had I not had access to that tutor, I really would have struggled in calculus. Yeah. 
So I'm kind of going forward. My father was really good. Uh, he didn't really care what I graduated. He just find something to graduate. And I picked public affairs, which was, it was just, I got nine hours of social, and nine hours of poli sci. What is public affairs anyway? What do you do if you have a public affairs degree? It's actually the business of the government. So you, uh, you have a business degree, but if you're a bureaucrat um, in D.C. or in the state government, it's the business side of that. While I took mostly business classes, that's basically what public affairs was. And so I was fortunate um, to have all of these resources available to help me through, and I graduated with college with a 288 uh, yeah. in the process. So I got done, and I was fortunate because, um, because of swimming, I uh, would always take 15 hours the first semester, 12 the second. I still had 12 hours to graduate, so I took a summer school class. Uh, and then I had nine hours my last semester, so I went for four and a half years, and I really spent that year to integrate to find out what it's like not to swim four hours a day and kind of mainstream. And at that time, I was fortunate because I was interviewing. And because I had traveled so much and because of my swimming background and some other things, and I'm a talker, um, it was pretty easy for me to sell myself. And I was interviewing for sales jobs, and I had a lot of success. And again, I was in an environment where I was only taking nine hours to graduate. Uh, all of it, six of it was pass fail. <laughs> so only one class was really for a grade. So I really had a lot of time to really focus in on the academic, I mean, the, the interviewing process like no others and didn't have as much competition because it was off of Europe. Fortunately, I got a job with uh, Aetna, uh, the insurance company, and they took me to Hartford to train for uh uh, three months and I was back in a classroom environment and it was perfect environment for me because they would lecture and it was interactive with all the different areas of it and I say it was interactive because that's really kind of how I learned and I got through got done and the interesting thing about my job is because they hired and they you were there to stay for life and my job they expected that you're going to go out into the real world and you would screw it up you know that was your job was to be to be in a location or a field office and they would move you about two years or three years into it so that you could kind of start anew. So there was an expectation that you're a snot-nosed kid and you're going to uh, scup your, your feet a little bit, but you would be moved. And in fact, I was in Garden City, Long Island for a period of time before they closed that office and they moved me into Manhattan. Again, it was very fortunate for me because it was built into the process. It was able, allowed me to go out there and learn um, and not get it right, but actually be able to start over. So you're starting to see a pattern here of slow learning, accommodations, and strategies that kind of came along. The other thing that was really cool at what I did is reading and writing is difficult for me, but back in those days, we dictated. Um, and so I could just sit and dictate a letter to anybody what I was doing, and I had somebody else who could take care of all that for me. Um, I was out of the office about half the time. I was in half the time. It was really ideal for somebody like me because I had a whole, whole clerical staff to fix what I couldn't do, but at the same time, I could kind of get out and about. So that's kind of a little bit of a lead in, and we move into Manhattan. All of a sudden, there's people around. Um, I'm starting to get my sea legs with me a little bit. It's very much a talking. It's very much interacting, but what's also important was I wasn't I was business to business sales. I was selling to a middle person, not the end user. And you never close the sale because an agent, broker, consultant, you're just trying to get your share and you would never make them uncomfortable. And I know a lot of other people with ADC have difficulty putting pressure on people because they don't like pressure themselves. And so it was great for me. All I had to do was go in and educate uh, my understanding of what was going on and never really have to do the hard things that I found difficult. So. With all that stuff, I want to pause and see if you've got any questions or see if I need to fill I mean, in. I'm just there. thinking at so many times, I, you know, you talk to young people who have ADHD and or even adults who are looking to change jobs. And it's always, you know, how am I possibly going to? And really, it's looking for, I mean, these things seem to fall into you into your lap in some ways, but um, finding the way that you operate best and positioning yep. yourself so that you can do your best. I mean, making yep. sure that you're in a job where you have, uh, you know, somebody to, to type up your dictations and making sure that you're not the closer because that's not your strong yep. suit that, you know, yep. you're the guy who comes in and educates and gets them interested and, yep. you know, yep. does the pitch. Yep. Um, 
and that and then I also think I mean how how fantastic it would be to not have to work in the same job setting for more than two or three years because that's usually yep. about the length of time that people with ADHD have before they start getting bored and yep. restless and things either start going yep. wrong or you know they're looking for another opportunity so that was like built into yep. this for you absolutely um, and, and the moves by the way they paid for the moves and all, i mean all the whole kit and caboodle was all built into what i was doing it was it was, yep. it, was it was spectacular yeah so I, I tell you what let's go to break real quick and we'll come back i want to kind of pick up there and kind of get into more of some of the meat that's kind of going on i know if you're out there listening and you want to learn more about me go to digcoaching.com and uh, Kirsten, you want to plug you and your And friends? if you want to learn more about what's going on in uh, your ADHD life or my ADHD life, you can go to youradhdlife.com or on Facebook at facebook.com backslash youradhdlife. With that, we'll be right back. We're back. All right. We're back. We're Yay! back. So before, before the break, I was kind of teeing up kind of my life all the way up into the 90s. And it was kind of interesting because I ended up um, – had an opportunity to, to leave New York. Uh, I won't get into a lot of details, but I came down to Florida with another insurance company. It was an interesting situation because it was, uh, it was a new office. Um, and at the time, as a salesperson, you actually got to price out insurance contracts for large employers. Like if you had a 1000 employees and you had a health insurance plan, I could actually determine what the rates were. And it was fascinating because the way they taught it was a very hands-on arithmetic, get out of the math. And what's fascinating to me is how much I hated algebra uh, when I was in school, but how much I dug it at that point in time because I was oh, yeah. solving real life problems. I would get information in and say, I'm missing something because it was tangible and I could see it and I could touch it and I could feel it. All of a sudden, I'm like, I'm into this. And we were, I was with a company that really wasn't very strong, but I left that company for another one. And what's fascinating is that experience that I had in the next job was spectacular because that company was trying to get out of smaller group market and larger group market, but I could actually understand the pricing mechanisms of the underwriters that I was working with and was able to get some trust. And again, same job where I was traveling all over Florida, uh, I was a triathlete at the time. Everywhere I went, there was a place to work out. I mean, it was just, it fit my, my life like a glove, still could dictate. I had all that stuff that was kind of coming around. And I'm having so much success, I'm going, hey, wait a second. I decided to get my MBA through all this. And so I go get my MBA. At the time, I was a master swim coach for fun. I had an assistant. I had an office manager, what I did. And so when I went out to, to actually get my MBA, I had all these people. If I couldn't make a swim practice, my assistant could do it, like whether I was out of town. I had an office manager that, that, that we communicated real well. Everything was in place, so I go off and get my MBA, and I have all these resources available to me, and I get into it, and I'm, I'm focusing in on finance, and if you know anything about dyslexia, the higher you go in academia, the easier it gets. And when I, when I started looking at finance, it's all about relationships. There's no absolutes. It's this ratio compared to that ratio over time, and I absolutely loved it. And, but the thing about it is, is I could spend as much time on it as I wanted while I was working because I controlled everything. And I, it took me a lot longer to study, but I was able to kind of grasp it. I get out, I get into the upstart world. Um, I left and got an organization was going public. And that was interesting the first time that I was like, I thought I was, I had it all down. I was this business guy. And all of a sudden I started seeing some really glaring problems. I could conceptualize things that I needed to do. I understood it from an MBA perspective. But when we sat down to put it together, I was having difficulty because now I'm in the upstart world it was actually a, a telecommunications company, what's called a CLEC back then. And there's no secretaries. It's just a big room with a bunch of cubes. I'm on a computer and not only am I not talking, there's people sitting across from me that want to instant message me. I'm like, hello, I'm a human. Stand and look at me. And all of a sudden I started to really struggle. Conceptually, I had some really good ideas. The company grew from like a hundred employees to I think, 1400 we went public when I was there uh, eight months after there we had a, a market cap of a billion and a half but we grew too fast and I ended up leaving uh, 
got the only time I could and I was able to cash out on some options that I had, uh, but I left because I knew that I couldn't survive, but because it had grown, my job really wasn't there, so it wasn't like I got let go of. It was just I, I couldn't do what I needed to do if I could do it. So then I left and I got a consulting gig and I thought, hey, this is really great. And all of a sudden, more and more of my challenges really started to kind of come into play. But at the time, I had an organizational um, uh, system that I have. I still have it today. Oversimplified is everything's on a piece of paper. I write it. It goes into a folder that's that's dated like uh, the 15th is the 15th of the month. And if I have something I got to follow up, it goes into that. And every day I pull out and I go through it and it gets cycled until it gets taken care of or, or archived. I have a, a physical way of doing that and a digital way of doing it. I've had it for years and it really kind of helped me survive. I had the academic background. I had the experience background. So I knew what I was talking about, but when I had to sit down and actually execute, I was starting to have some real big problems. Yep. And the organization that I was with was trying to get into an area that he didn't really know that. So I was seen as a knowledge warehouse, but I was really struggling at this point in time because I was really starting to understand things that I couldn't do. And I was not a jack of all trades. Yep. I end up going um, back into the insurance world and now everything is completely changed. It's all digital. And I am a deer in the headlights because contracts have changed. Everything has changed and there's no more, conversations it's all digital and i was really 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 having a lot of anxiety i really? didn't realize were you really really <laughs> so i end up leaving and i end up kind of getting to the coaching world and it's interesting because in this world it's all a free-for-all on your own and where i'm kind of going with this is time has passed i've had to figure some things out i've had some personal issues in my life um which i don't really want to get into where now i'm being judged based off of the successes that I've had in my life. And what's frustrating to me, Kirsten, is I have definitely had a lot of successes, both non-monetary and monetary, but all of them were compensatory strategies or things that were in place when they were there. And everybody's looking at the outcome. Nobody is listening to me right now for the resources and the support that I had in place. So it's a little frustrating these days because there's this expectation for me to perform, but it's without the systems that I had in place. You know what this reminds me of though? I mean, how many times we all in ADHD world um, talk about, hearing from the teachers or going back and looking at our report cards, you know, why can't you just, yep. you know, Kirsten could be so successful if she could, would just, or Jeff could be so successful if he would just, you know, he's got such great potential. Um, all of these things because throughout our law, I mean, ADHD is inconsistent, yes. right? There are times when we're in our zone in the areas that we excel at and are interested in and we are performing like rock stars and then there are those things that are just beyond us you know we may have the the no the knowledge but being able to implement put into place yep. i like being in a startup you know yep. having a lot of bits of information but putting them into this you know container and making it go forward is a whole other thing yep. um and you know or being in real estate, when you've got all of these things, in, or not real estate, in insurance, being in that when you had certain supports in place and people are just seeing you're successful, not the because yep. of, and now you go back yep. into the industry, it's set up totally differently. Why can't you be successful? You could meet your potential if you would just work a little harder, or do this a little yes. different. And right. And so it's parents, teachers, coworkers, other adults and sometimes our kids don't see that sometimes there's a lot going on behind the curtain yep that's helping us to be successful that nobody else sees yep yep it's it's funny because when people are around you and they know you they're supporting you but then when sometimes when tables turn they're kind of like your enemy at this point in time and they're getting you because again there's all that stuff that yeah. you have that they don't see and they think it really really comes easily and so 
we probably need to go to break here in a second because one of the things that I really has been interesting to me, and you know that I'm a big Dr. Barkley fan, and he defines ADHD as a self-regulation issue, and it changed my career coaching when I began to understand ADD manifests as a attention regulation issue and an emotional regulation issue. Yes. And when I'm working with people, some people struggle more with one than the other, and I always understood everything as an attentional issue. But now I'm realizing how much the emotion plays into it. When we get back after break, I want to really talk about how important that is, uh, particularly in the area that I'm kind of talking about. So, so if people are looking for you, Jeff, as we go to break, just remind them wh what your website is. It's digcoaching.com. That's like digaholecoaching.com. And Kirsten? Youradhdlife.com. Like youradhdlife.com. <laughs> All right. We'll be right back after these messages. So Jeff, before we went to break, you and I were talking about the kind of the downfall of being good at something, at being successful when you have ADHD and how that can really, um, I mean, sometimes I hate to say it, there's motivation to not do well because yeah. we can, right? Because we can yep, yep. be held accountable. If you can yep. do it well one time, you should do it well yep. every time. Or if you, you know, if you can do this well, why can't you do that well? Um, and one thing that we all know about ADHD is that it, it can be very inconsistent both across time on the same type of tasks, um, but also between tasks. And sometimes our success is because of what people aren't seeing that's going yep. on because we're in the right setting. We've had, you know, better sleep. Um, there's something that's very motivating about what's happening in the moment. And when we do it the next time, yep. our brains just aren't as engaged in the task yep. um, or situations have changed. Like you were talking about selling insurance the first time you had all these supports and then you went yep. back to it later on and those yeah, supports aren't there anymore. How come you're not successful? Yep. So dictating like a stream of consciousness for somebody to make some sense of it and get all the grammar right is no longer around anymore. Uh, to have somebody where you just walk in and say, can you organize this file for me? And they do it and it comes back to you and it makes some sense and they get rid of the garbage. When you've got somebody where you just say, like file this so that I can go back and they handle that stuff. And now you don't have that stuff anymore. People forget that's the invisible side. And so where this is interesting to me, one of the reasons I wanted to do this because more and more I'm frustrated. I, I know I'm, I'm, I know I can do things because I've had a track record. I know I can, I have been successful. I also know that it takes me longer to learn than other people. And I also know that I need certain support structures and nobody, I mean, I say those words, but people just goes right over the head. Uh, they don't really understand what it's like to live it. And so there's a fair amount of frustration that I live with. And it's been very difficult because for the longest time I was trying to get them to get it. And it was, it was kind of funny. Rick Green kind of taught me a long time ago. Number one, don't confuse people with the facts when their mind's made up. And you can tell the story, but at the end of the day- wait, wait, you, gotta slow, you gotta slow down and say that again. Rick Green said, don't confuse people when the, with the facts when their, when mind their minds made are made up. And, yep. and, and, and it's, it's so true. Um, and it was hard because you want people to kind of get it, but they really, do, they jump ahead of you and presume the end and they never listen to it because they haven't really experienced. So where I'm going with this is, is I'm spending a lot of time really focused on the emotional self-regulation because in the last uh, period of time, I've had much more difficulty with that internal frustration of I can do this, but the pressure that's being put on me to perform when it takes me longer to learn something and I'm having to do it without those things that were there and, Everybody acknowledges them, but they don't give them to me or give me the time. I'm spending a lot more with that pause, breathe, downregulate, trying to detach myself from the emotions because that doesn't help me. It actually it just compounds everything. Me. Yeah, it compounds everything. And it's been interesting to me because I really feel from a coaching perspective and some other things, I know on Attention Talk Radio, we've been doing a lot more talking about the emotional self-regulation because what I find is when it comes to self-regulating, emotions are the hardest part of it all. And you can't 
self-regulate your attention until you can self-regulate your emotions. And it's one of those things that's, it's, it's a, it's a daily challenge just to pause and let it go. And it's fascinating to me how at different times in meditation or spirituality for me, exercise, there's all kinds of different things. I haven't totally cracked the code because I get all over the place, but I will say it's, it's my life at this point in time. And what's frustrating to me was I was smart enough, I think, and lucky enough to either have figured out all these strategies or they've been a part of my environment. So I'm grateful for the success. I sometimes wonder what my life would have been like had I not had that stuff there. I do feel like I'm paying the price for it now in a negative way. And I'm having to deal with the emotional side a lot more just to kind of get by and reflect and be grateful on that. So I want to kind of give you some opportunity to kind of comment on that. And I, I do want to say is I hope if you're listening to this or watching this, that if you're experiencing this, it is a challenge. Be grateful what you have. And it's all about self-regulation and grateful, grateful, grateful that you are this far is probably one of the more powerful ways to just kind of like pause and down regulate. So Kirsten thoughts. Um, I've been working with quite a few adults lately actually who are in their career crisis. And so this is interesting because a lot of times what's preventing them from either going to their next um, workplace or making changes in their current work environment is the emotional piece mm -hmm. that it's so triggering. Why can't I just, or, you know, why can't other people just realize that? Um, and it's maddening to, to be bright um, and to know where your strengths are or to know that you even have, you know, phenomenal yep. strengths and feel like you just can't get past these blocks or you can't just yep. get these yep. things in place that you need um, so that you can be successful. Um, and it's, so it's been a theme that's been coming up a lot lately. Like I said, um, doing a lot of career coaching. Um, so you just kind of sparked something as a side to this. I have, I, years ago I said this, like, you know how Kirsten, sometimes you say something and when it comes out of your mouth, it's news to you. Right. Uh, I often tell the people that I'm working with is, you know, society is going to bully you and to do it their way because it's really convenient for them. Yep. And I'm sharing this because I think more and more in life, society is doing that in general and everybody gets bullied to a degree. I mean, I know I'm a big advocate for those with ADHD and many of them are very visual and their working memory is limited. And this whole go green thing is punitive to them. And it's funny how they hold it up as, we are championing how we're going green, but they're actually punishing everybody out there and feeling good about it. And I say that because a little bit of my experience in my personal life, and I guess in, in general, is I do feel bullied sometimes because if I would just do it their way, it would be really be convenient. So every day I kind of fight that with the emotional self-regulation and the pause and find gratitude and kind of what's going on. And so I just want to throw that in there because I, I think everybody, ADD or not, is getting more and more of that as society moves along so quickly. We're having to learn so much, so so much faster than we used to, and it's world's changing, and you're expected to change yourself to adapt to these things. I, I think it's gonna lead to a lot of depression in the future, but for right now, at least for me, I know is that emotional self-regulation and the gratitude and, and really trying to calm myself is really the biggest tool that I have right now uh, to manage it. So. Perfect. We need to have a whole conversation about emotional self-regulation and how to manage that period. So, well, it's, we've done a lot of shows on it. I, we I we talked to Sesame Street. We talked to, anyway, not to go into that stuff, but uh, we- On we, attentiontalkradio.com. Yep. There, there you go. So <laughs> with that, any questions, anything left to say, or was it time to wrap this up? I think it's time to wrap this up, Jeff. All right. You've shared a lot with us today. What do you think is the biggest takeaway that you want people to hear from the experiences that you've had over your lifetime? Um, what, what I want to communicate out there is, I think Ned Hollowell uh, described it as, is if you've got a condition and you get it properly diagnosed and you properly treated, uh, there's hope. You can live a very fulfilling life. And by accident, I had a lot of that just fell into my lap. Um, I figured out a lot of it. I've had a very, very, very fulfilling life. I still have a lot to go. Uh, but if you're listening to this, I just want you to know 
that there's other people out there like me that deal with this frustration every single day. So it's not that you're that special. Just know that you're out there and it's just a part of stuff. It's not necessarily easy. I encourage you to practice the self-regulation. And I really just want those out there who identify with this to know that they're not isolated. They're not the only one. And that I think some of this is baked into society and the self-regulate and be grateful for what you have and focus in on that because that's what will get you through it. And that's the biggest message I could I could share out there. And again, I really wanted to do this show so other people that identify with it would feel like they're not the only one and that there's a community out there. And um, certainly a dig coaching. If you got any questions, we'd love to hear from you. And I know Kirsten would love to hear from you. Absolutely. So there you have I'm it. Always looking for questions and comments that our audience has about any topic we talk about and a lot of topics we don't talk about. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, this was the first of our hopefully many absolutely absolutely <laughs> new I was, format cross-promoted right. content right. a lot of fun a lot of fun <laughs> so kirsten thanks for coming on to this i appreciate it thank you jeff i'll talk to you soon and i hope everybody goes to your adhdlife.com and catches more of your shows and this and also if you're go to attention life, talk radio or dig coaching like dig a hole that's right <laughs> digcoaching.com take care bye If you've enjoyed the show, please like us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash your ADHD life. This is Dr. Kirsten Milliken. Until next time, have fun and find ways to play.